Uh, thank you for coming. It is uh, with great pleasure that I'm introducing Professor Imogen Tyler of Lancaster University. Uh, Imogen's research is concerned with social inequalities, power, injustice, and resistance. In 2010, Imogen was awarded a Leverium Research Fellowship, and the major outcome of this fellowship was the monograph, Revolting Subjects, Social Objection and Resistance in Neoliberal Britain. This monograph was shortlisted for the Bread and Roses Prize for radical publishing. In 2014, Imogen was awarded a Phil Philip Leverium Prize, which is supporting her current research project on stigma. The major outcomes of this project are a sociological review monograph on the sociology of stigma, edited with Tom Slater, a single authored book provisionally entitled Stigma Machines, which is work in progress, a series of peer reviewed journal articles a collaboration with the graphic artist Charlotte Bailey on a zine of her essay, From Stigma Power to Black Power, and a collaboration with the graphic artist Tom Morris on the creation of an animated stigma machine. And at this point, I shall just hand over to Imogen, who will speak for about 45 minutes as usual, and then about half an hour discussion. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out um, on this beautiful day when you're all probably retired, getting towards the end of your term here at Liverpool Hope. So really nice to see you all. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a bit of this book that I'm trying to write at the moment that is called Stigma Machines at the moment. I don't know what the subtitle is yet. Um, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about a bit of the book that's about poverty and stigma and austerity. Um, and thank you, Diana, for inviting me to come. So I want to begin... <coughs> so this is what I'm going to talk about. We might not get to rage against the machines at the end, but we could do that together, if you like. But I'll hopefully get through at least the first two bits of this and, and indicate the f something about the third bit too. But I want to begin with some um, real voices uh, about living with austerity. So I want to begin with a testimony from a young man who I've been working with as part of um, a local poverty truth commission in Lancaster and Morecambe. It's called Daniel and at yeah, the launch of our local Poverty Truth Commission, uh, he stood up and delivered a testimony to a room of about 100 people in Lancaster and um, uh, Lancaster City Hall. So he was talking to, testifying along with others about his experience of living through the last decade of austerity in the UK to politicians, business people, GPs, charities, you name it, firefighters, etc. were there. And since then, I've been working as part of this group. And he's given me his permission to share some of his testimony with you to begin this talk tonight. And this is how it goes. I was one of nine kids. My mum was felt forced to drug deal. It was the only way she could feed us. The stress on her of not knowing where the next meal was coming from, it all rubbed off on us kids. Kids absorb things like that. It's really hard living like that. The thing that held us together was the community, the people in our estate. Everyone would chip in to buy food for people like us who didn't have enough. My Nana was the heart of the estate. She took all the kids out, taking us on mini buses for days out, out of her own pocket at first, so we had something to do because we had nothing. And parents could have one day without worrying then about feeding the kids. Then she started running the community centre. The place was heaving with kids all the time. It was a tiny hut in the car park of our school. Everything happened there. It was magical. We had parties there. It was a place of no worries. There was meals there too. That was so important. If it wasn't for my nan and all she did for me and all the other kids, I would have killed myself. Ten years ago, the youth workers from the council came and did a project, a massive music gig with all the lads and girls from the local council estates. It was amazing. 
all us kids from the same background, all in poverty, and without that project, we just have ended up scrapping and gang wars because it was the only way we had of releasing all the anger that we had. The project brought everyone together. It stopped all the fighting and gang crimes. It was the best thing I've ever done. It was amazing. Everybody said that. Then the funding was taken away from us and we were left with nothing. Our school was good. I had no bully in there. Many of the kids had serious difficulties, ADHD, Asperger's. You weren't judged. They treated you like family. They got to know your parents. They went to appointments with us. You felt accepted there. Dave, you've, you've shut down our school too. It's upsetting because I know this person so well to even read this again. He's an amazing young man. <coughs> that he read this out to you know, 100 people in a town hall. It was hugely brave. Then when you've got nowhere to go and nothing to do, you get bullied. Kids, 13, 15, whatever, young kids. The main drug dealers get you to sell heroin and crack. You're so afraid of what will happen to you if you don't do it and there's nothing else. If all the youth stuff hadn't been taken away, we wouldn't have been pulled away to the streets to these men. A few of my mates have to hide guns for them. They pay you. And when you're young, brothers and sisters need to be fed. It's stressful trying to make the right decisions. I thought my mum never knew where we were getting the money from. I had a paper round and I pretended it was that I gave her. I hold the councillors who made these decisions responsible for what happened to me. They don't understand what they destroyed by taking these activities away. It was the only freedom we had and it was taken away. We were just a number to them. Then everything goes from worse to worse. My family gets evicted. We're moved to another area where we don't know anyone. Then your property needs work doing to it and the landlord won't do it. It's condemned and you, you're moved on again. Same thing happened again, condemned, move, moved on. It didn't matter if my mum had to live in her mate's one bedroom flat and sleep on the floor with my brothers and sisters. Nobody cares. When you're in poverty, you end up with nothing because it's all taken away and nobody cares. I became homeless, but they said I wasn't a priority need as I was 24. Street homeless and the council told me I'm not a priority need. The council don't help you if you're homeless and young. It's all the charities and the churches. The council just tell you if you're sleeping at a charity shelter, you're not sleeping rough. You have no hope. It feels like the government are trying to make a superior race. The rich get rich and the poor get poorer. That causes the poor to do crimes like robbing to feed their kids. How can this be fair? The government believes in money more than human beings. All they do is take, take, take. They worship money instead of heart. They give me a number. When you speak my name, that means you want to talk to me. I am Daniel Joshua Berber. When you give me a number, my national insurance number, my NHS number, my tax code, you just want to talk money, but my name is Daniel Joshua Berber. If I had one thing to say to the government, it would be treat me as you want to be treated. See me as a number, person not a number. See me as living, I am flesh and blood. And that's just an extract from his testimony. I should have got someone else to read that. It's quite hard for me to read it when I know him so well now and count him as a friend and a survivor. In the 2017 Amnesty International report, in the annual report, Amnesty International detailed what they described as a global trend towards an angrier and more divisive politics, in which the idea of human dignity and equality was under vigorous and relentless assault from powerful narratives of blame, fear and scapegoating propagated by those who seek, sought to take or cling on to power. In Britain, we're currently witnessing this vigorous and relentless assault 
on human dignity and equality in a variety of ways. But in this lecture, what I'm going to focus on is the concerted efforts of the elites, politicians, news journalists and television producers to narrativize the 2008-9 North Atlantic crisis in the global financial markets as a crisis of the welfare state and specifically as a crisis of dependency. That is a crisis that was caused by undeserving people who it was argued had become dependent on hardworking taxpayers. So the financial crisis, was, which is over a decade now ago, was first understood as originating in the financial sector. Anti-austerity protesters, for example, you see here some symbolically hung figures of profligate bankers outside the Bank of England. But the cause of the crash was rapidly relocated into a different cast of figures. Welfare scroungers, benefits cheats, quickly po populated the cultural landscape for figures for a different storing of crisis. And what I call a welfare stigma machine cranked into operation. And rapidly, it was people like Daniel who came to be imagined as the source of this crisis. People like Daniel who came to be criminalised for their poverty, accused and punished for defrauding the state. People like Daniel who were transformed into abjects of popular entertainment and derision. People like Daniel who, in the absence of the state, in the wake of its withdrawal, turned to petty crime to clothe and feed himself and his family. People like Daniel, who've seen themselves evicted and left to street, sleep in the streets, progressively dehumanised in the process of being caught up in the political and cultural machinery of austerity. People like Daniel, who reduced to having to, e to claim, to insist on their personhood, on their humanity, in the face of overwhelming stigma production from above. Working as a sociologist on issues of welfare reform and cuts to services, you encounter stigma everywhere. The word, the term, the concept, and expressions of dehumanisation that stigma as a concept describe. Stigma kind of appears continually in everyday conversations about poverty, in people's testimonial experiences of being stigmatised. Within everyday understanding, stigma is imagined as something akin to being badged, labelled or stereotyped. We think of it as a discriminatory practice which emerges in our social interactions with each other. Stigma, we imagine, as a process of othering, as kind of something which is impressed upon you by somebody else. Stigma is present, we know, from um, talking to people in the language spoken by welfare workers, for example, when they talk about their clients. Stigma is also designed into deterrent policies which ostensibly seek to get people off benefits and into work. Stigma frames media coverage of welfare issues and saturates political speeches and think tank reports in, in both explicit and coded ways. Stigma is also present in anti-stigma initiatives, which are the focus of lots of different types of charitable campaigns, including anti-poverty <laughs> campaigns. In the wake of the global financial crisis in 2008, in 2010, the charity Poverty Alliance Scotland launched a campaign called Stick Your Labels to challenge the stigma of poverty. It emerged out of a working group comprised of community activists affiliated with Poverty Alliance and people with direct experience of living with poverty in Scotland. Their Stick Your Labels manifesto led to a campaign of actions centred on both highlighting and disrupting 
stigmatising messages and myths about people living on low, low incomes. Um, so they do work with businesses and in workplaces. They do workshops with kids in schools. They've made a series of films with people of experiences of living in poverty, which they've put online. And all of this collectively is tr to try and challenge the myths and stereotypes about poverty. It's underpinned by an understanding of poverty as a structural phenomena, as an outcome of political decision making. And this intersects with much longer, that intersects with much longer histories of discrimination against particular groups, disabled people, women, people from black and ethnic minority communities. They understand poverty as an issue of social justice. But what I want to do is say that these campaigns are great, but actually we need to supplement them with something else which is a deeper understanding of stigma as a form of power and a form of governmentality. So one of the limits, I think, of sociological understandings of stigma is it's quite trapped or caught within a kind of frame of in social interaction, uh, what people say or do to each other and how to intervene in that sphere, which is good. But I'm, I want to make an, a, a, diff, a different account or supplement that with an account of stigma as something that's produced from above and is something that's more historical. So I want to look up to think about sites of stigma production. And I want to look back to think about much longer history of the relationship between stigma and capitalism. So what I'm talking about really is thinking about stigma isn't something which not only accompanies poverty, a side effect if you like, but thinking about stigma something more like a technology, a tactic of statecraft. So the activation of poverty stigma is often an integral component of governmental projects to govern welfare. It's deployed as a method to deter people, for example, from claiming benefits or other forms of relief. And it's used as a means to discipline people into new forms of work. So without a more political and economic understanding of stigma as a technology for the government of welfare and the government of people through welfare, a means through which popular understandings of who is deserving and who is eligible are reproduced. We kind of um, miss um, the relations of power that I think are at stake in the experiences of people like Daniel. But what is stigma? So I've given you some sense of, of how we ordinarily might think about the term, and I'm sure you've all got a sense of how you might use the term or how in everyday use. But what I'm doing in my project is also trying to kind of give stigma a little bit more teeth as a kind of concept with which to think about power uh, and politics. So stigma politics and stigma power. And so one of the things I do, and I'm not going to digress too far into this because it might bore you stupid if I do, but one of the things that I do in the book is actually go back to the etymology of the term. Um, so it's a Greek word, or it comes from a group of Greek, ancient Greek words, which mean basically to tattoo. So what it means is to puncture and tattoo the body, and it was used... In, in ancient Greece and Rome, the word uh, as a term mainly to punish slaves. Um, and you will be stigmatized, tattooed with ink, like you tattoo, like tattoos now. Um, probably slightly different, but more or less the same. Uh, but you'd be stigmatized with the name of your crime, uh, normally on your forehead where it was visible. Um, and it was a means to, for example, if you ran away, you would have, stop me, I'm a runaway, tattooed across your face. 
So it's a kind of way of shaming somebody, but also kind of capturing labour and um, stopping somebody from escaping. <coughs> it was only, never, and the citizens were never tattooed, only slaves, migrant workers, captured enemy soldiers. Very often when you were stigmatised, it came with a sentence, especially in the Roman period, and you would be um, sent to the mines, maybe to build roads in Britain for seven years, to hard labour, to an exile, so you'd be deported for a period as well as being stigmatised. So this kind of history is quite interesting. So if we think about, start to think about stigma, uh, in the 20th century, we start to think about more stigma much more psychologically. But actually, if we go back to this kind of the history and this history of marking the bodies of criminals and other social outcasts or people that um, are subject to punishment or control continues within Europe from that period onwards. Um, if we start to think about stigma as a form of power that's kind of written on the body, if we start to think about stig how stigma is impressed upon us, it starts to give the concept a little bit more teeth than just the psychological concept that we've kind of inherited from the 20th century and from psychology where actually kind of power and relations of power kind of drop out a bit out of our understanding of the term. So I won't talk about Goffman because I'm going to run out of time. But basically I have a bit of an, this is where I have an argument and you might not know Goffman's work, but I have an argument with Goffman about his concept of stigma, which is really what popularises and buttresses the sociological concept of stigma today, still, largely. And I have a bit of an argument with, uh, with Goffman about his, the way in which power drops out of his account of stigma. And I try and say we need to put the power back in and we need to think about this longer histories of classification, of marking the body. <coughs> Does that all make sense so far? Okay. <clears throat> so one of the things I do in the bigger book is look at these genealogies of stigma to think about what they can teach us about power and how power works through stigma in the present. And we can think of lots of threads and lines. I mean, as soon as you start thinking about this, lots of different historical threads uh, we can think about about how Sh um, sh public shame tactics have been used in different historical periods, how in particular stigma is tied up uh, with race and racism, uh, with eugenics, with imperial and colonial forms of control. So as soon as you start to unpack and think about stigma as something that's written on the body, that you kind of get all of these historical threads that are actually really useful for thinking about what's happening in the contemporary moment. Okay. So, for example, a good example would be the return, and this is a big debate in the US in particular, but you can see it beyond the US, which is the return in, the, in a context of a liberal, well, ostensibly liberal democracy like the US of shaming practices. So this is where judges can offer... Um, um, somebody who's been convicted of a crime, a choice between a prison sentence or a shame sentence. And a shame sentence might involve having to stand outside holding a sign, saying that whatever it is that you've done wrong. Um, and this is like proliferating, it's a big kind of debate in criminology and legal studies about the return of shame. It's also something the Nazis did when they came to power in Germany, they had this very similar debate about how honour should be the basis of the fascist legal system in Germany. And they attempted to replace uh, their existing legal system with a shame, um, shame system. So this is something we need to be alert to, the, the kind of histories and the repetition and the reappearance of kind of shame and stigma in the public sphere. We need to think about what's going on there, who's producing it, for what purposes, who's being targeted, and uh, what can it tell us about what's going on. <coughs>
So back to the UK, what we know is happening is, uh, and this is actually not just the UK, we can track this a bit more globally too, but it's a kind of shift from uh, welfare policies which are concerned with alleviating the shame of poverty to forms of policy making which are designed to activate stigma. So for example, Robert Walker, who does a kind of global study of this, says we're seeing a kind of return of shame. Uh, he doesn't talk about quite as, as a form of government in the way I do, but he's talking about how shame is something welfare contracts historically, it's more generous or less generous over different periods of time. And what Walker's saying is what we can see at the moment is a kind of return of shame to, to as disincentives for people to um, claim relief or as kind of political justification um, for not distributing the resources of society more equally. Ruth Lister was writing about this in the 1990s, about the restoration of stigma as an instrument of social policy. So if you look at the history of welfare, stigma's always been there. That is one of the characteristics of welfare, is, is it more or less stigmatising? Yeah, it was there even in the creation of the welfare state after the Second World War. But one of the things that Beveridge said, for example, is when he created the welfare state in Britain, was he wanted to diminish stigma so more people would claim, but he also wanted to retain a little bit of it as a kind of disincentive uh, for people um, to claim who weren't deserving. So deserving and undeserving is always there, and stigma's always there to mark that different, that distinction between who's deserving and undeserving. But what we're seeing under austerity and what we saw from 2010 in particular was kind of like a massive government campaign aimed at mass stigma production. And what was incredible about the campaign when we look back and see that it was like reality TV, it was so many different newspapers, the sort of outpouring of different uh, production of stigmatising depictions of welfare claimants, particularly working age welfare claimants, as well as what government ministers were saying. Then we saw how, for example, government ministers would be using the examples of Benefit Street, Poverty Porn TV, to talk about in the House of Commons to legitimate their policy. So we saw this massive upsurge in the kind of cultural, social and political production of stigma. Okay. So we see this shift, we see a financial crisis become re-narrated as a kind of crisis uh, of welfare dependency. And we see this really quickly cranking in. So we see Ian Duncan Smith, who was then um, her Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, who were the architects of welfare reform, talking about the problem of a benefits culture, that this is a national crisis that, that must end. Uh, this dependency culture that is unsustainable. And this is repeated, repeated, repeated in lots of different kind of media forms and different sites. We hear him again in 2015 talking about the introduction of universal credit. So this is the welfare reform, big bill going through, and talking about this culture of welfare dependency, um, how we're completely shifting and changing the welfare culture, no longer just pouring money in as Labour did, and maintaining people in dependency. So there's a, a set of kind of key terms that kind of reappear, reappear. Benefits culture, dependency, crisis, uh, and we, this cast of figures um, of these people who are dependent, who are undeserving, appear alongside another set of figures, a hardworking taxpayer who's having who's a kind of moral figure, the deserving figure, who's having to support this undeserving caste. So one of the questions that I'm asking is what feeds, you know, what, where does, why, why 
do we vote for something like austerity? Where, what, where does consent come from? And what role does this kind of stigma production in, in, by politicians, in, um, in media, play in the kind of legitimation of austerity politics? Who crafts welfare stigma? Who's crafting it? Who's making it? Who funds its production? Why is the stigmatisation of welfare so effective when it actually undermines mass services from which the vast majority of the population um, uses and depends on? So one of the things I'm trying to ask is by looking up as well as looking back to cite a stigma production is say that we need to understand how the crafting of consent happens because we live in a democracy, ostensibly at the moment, it's a bit in crisis at the moment, but we do. So, the, the, so how democratic, liberal democratic systems work has to be through the production of consent. And that's where stigma in a way plays a really important role in that. We don't live in a one party state, authoritarian state yet. So we, we do get to make some choices about um, the type of society that we live in. And what I'm saying is we have to look at the role of stigma in producing democratic consent for how social wealth and resources are distributed. Okay, so this slide is just to show how uh, reality TV production, so with this massive explosion of reality TV um, that's depicting uh, the undeserving um, on our screens, recirculates back into political discourse, into the House of Commons. So this is from the House Hansard, House of Commons record, where you can see a kind of staged, if you like, performance of Philip Davis, a Conservative MP, saying, has Ian Duncan Smith watched these programmes? Has he been struck by the people on these programmes complaining about welfare reform, but they're able to smoke cigarettes, have tattoos, they watch Sky TV, have widescreen televisions? Does he understand the concerns and irritation of many people who pay their taxes but can't afford these kinds of luxuries. And Ian Duncan Smith replying, many people are shocked by what they see. This is why the public back our welfare reform package. So if you kind of read back through these debates and look what's happening, um, this is probably about 2012, you can see how there's this circulation across these different sites of kind of stigma production. It creates these categories of people and is used actively to then legitimate particular policies, uh, almost like a kind of st a theatre of stigma, a theatre, political theatre, but that has real effects, of course, on people's lives. <coughs> okay. So... <clears throat> in the so and you're probably familiar with some of that so quite a lot of sociologists and, and, and journalists too have written about how not maybe about in terms of stigma and power in quite the same way but have written about the kind of if you like the cultural narrating of austerity so austerity being displaced from being a crisis that emerged in the financial sector the to a crisis of the welfare state and how it's used to kind of implement um, this stigma production is used to implement austerity. But one of the things that I'm interested in doing also is kind of tracking that back and look at the, taking a longer view on the relationship between the history of social provision, the history of welfare and stigma craft. So changing practices of welfare stigma that stretch back to practices of the branding and badging of paupers um, in the medieval period up, up to the early 20th century. The long transition to modernity and industrial capitalism and the role of kind of stigma and symbolic shaming in those periods, historical periods, 
um, from the implementation of capitalism onwards. So I'm kind of interested in thinking about what is new here. So what might be new might be things like the forms that stigma production takes, social media, how we interact continuously online, television, reality television as a genre. They're all kind of, we can see a newness in the media, mediated forms stigma takes. But the other thing I'm interested actually is in the, con the consistencies. So one of the things that worries me is we tend to say that something is like neoliberal, that it's new, and that it, we're shocked and surprised that it's new. But actually that kind of t calling everything neoliberal disguises, I think, very often much more consistent and longer histories of... Um, government, for example, of poverty, through shaming techniques, through stigma. And some classic, a classic book that some of you might know on this is uh, Fox Piven and Cloward's book from 1971, which is, uh, sort of argues that we kind of tend to think that kind of welfare becomes more humane and more generous over time, that modern welfare states try and provide support in ways that avoid stigma associated with earlier periods. And they argue that that isn't true. They argue actually that what history tells us is stigma becomes, is some periods is more generous and less stigmatizing and other periods is much more punishing and more punitive. But it isn't a, it isn't a progress narrative. It's much more of a kind of up and down narrative and that kind of up and down narrative depends on what the imperatives of the rulers, the elites of capital at a particular moment are. So that what that tells us is if there's a financial crash, then we're very likely to see more stigma production from above. And if we kind of use history, actually, we might be more prepared for how to think about how to counter that when it emerges, rather than being surprised or shocked or outraged or disgusted, which we should be, but we actually might be more prepared if we thought about the history and thought about the kind of ways in which it actually this is quite familiar, it's quite consistent with the history uh, in the history of welfare capitalism. So one of the things that I do in the chapter of the book, it's a very long chapter, <laughs> I'm struggling to squeeze it in. It's, it's try and track this through badging. So that idea we talked about stigma as a, on your body as a tattoo and kind of using that, but looking at how uh, we move from tattooing and branding on the body, people who are vagabonds or who are criminalized in some way, to how things like badging, we're having to wear a badge if you sought relief from your parish, if you sought welfare, uh, unemployment relief or sickness relief in your parish, which you would have done um, in the 17th century. Um, you had to wear, or you might be forced to wear a cloth badge uh, on your clothes, which was there to kind of stigmatise you. It said that you were a claimant, a welfare claimant. So I'm trying to think about, in a way, how that kind of badging that was done in these earlier periods uh, we see repeated in different periods of welfare reform. And in a way, how something like Benefit Street, which is on TV, but then we're all tweeting about it and it's being reproduced in Parliament, etc., is kind of like a symbolic form of badging. So I'm trying to think about the, the consistency or the relationship between forms of badging that people actually had to wear on their body to the sort of symbolic type of badging that we see going on in a kind of mass media society. Okay. And I've obviously cut out a lot of historical material making that argument, but just bear with me. So you've got this sense in which auster poverty porn that we see emerging of austerity kind of functions in a way that's analogous to a form of badging the poor a naming and shaming a kind of marking out classification and judgment a kind of way of marking who's deserving and undeserving 
this idea of kind of intergenerational fecklessness of worklessness families. But also, and badging always perf has performed this function, it performed it in ancient Greece, when you were tattooed, it performs it today, it was also kind of a form of publicity. So it's a way of kind of producing political publicity, uh, you know, where you're used to warn others um, not to behave in the same way that you are. And also as a form of kind of entertainment. So the marking, the badging of the poor, kind of is consistent historically in, in the history, certainly, of uh, welfare and welfare capitalism. So one thing I'm quite interested in looking at is two particular moments of kind of what we could call welfare retrenchment. So two moments where there's a massive <coughs> shift or break. So two moments in, in, in the history of, of Britain that are really interesting to look at next to each other are Poor Law Amendment Act of 1934 and the Welfare Reform Act of Austerity that we're so familiar with of 2012, which both of which uh, have been described by different people and commentators. So we have Edward, um, e. P. Thompson describing the 1834 Act as the most sustained attempt to impose an ideological dogma in defiance of the evidence of human need in English history. But actually, they're very similar descriptions of what's been happening in Britain over the last decade. So, for example, um, Taylor Goodby, a social policist, talking, uh, social policy professor, talking about th that these are the deepest, what we're living through is the deepest and most precipitate precipitate cuts ever made in social provision. So these two kind of intense moments of where the welfare state's retracted. And in both of these periods, stigma is crucial to the implementation of reform. So that's what I'm really interested in, is looking at what kind of stigma, how stigma is used as a form of power to implement really punitive forms of, um, of welfare reform. So this is E.P. Thompson writing about the uh, early, about the early 19th century, the late 18th century. Paupers, he says, were increasingly perceived as designing rogues who under various pretense, pretenses were attempting to cheat the parish. Their whole abilities, so he's quoting here <coughs> somebody else um, writing about the problem of welfare scroungers in the 17th century, uh, early 19th century. The whole abilities are ex exerted in the execution of deceit, which may to procure from the parish officers an allowance of money for the idle, idle and profligate purposes. So if you go back and kind of read the debates that are taking place around the problem of welfare, the problem of poor relief uh, in, in the late 18th and early 19th century, what's incredible is how similar language is, how incredibly consistent it is with the sorts of language that we saw, particularly in this period of austerity. The medium of the media of change, we see this mass proliferation of pamphlets and essays, a kind of 18th century version of poverty porn on this topic, all written and published by, of course, the elites. And this is the, this is the age of printing press, of publishing, all written by the kind of, there's a new bourgeois middle class writing about oh, the problem of poor relief and the burden that it places on hardworking taxpayers of the period. And many of these um, welfare reformists were advocating introducing reintroducing more punitive systems of badging, imprisonment in workhouses, forms of which, which is basically forms of workfare. We have to work for your benefits and using shame sanctions as deterrent. So for example, um, sometimes people had to have their head shaved um, in order you know, to shame them if they claim relief, for example, and the wearing of badges, workhouse costumes, coats, etc. Okay, am I out of time here? Yeah.
So I'm not going to go into any more history, but you can see well, I was, uh, in the chapter, if I can fit it all in, I'm going to talk a little bit about Jeremy Bentham, who you might know from the kind of panopticon from uh, his, uh, who's a writing in the late 18th and early um, 19th century, who's a kind of one man social policy think tank. And his, he's uh, a kind of, a, I suppose we call it the right wing end now of welfare reform in his periods. And his idea is to create a kind of, what to do with this problem of poverty in his period is to create uh, what he calls a, a domestic colony within the state, to, within the state, to colonize within the state and to create a kind of new company, a private, we call it a private public company today, um, which he's going to own and run, and he's going to have the power to build 5,000 um, industry houses to imprison people in one in nine people uh, in the population who would be then put into his houses and will be used to, as a kind of captive labour force. And obviously his plans didn't come to fruition, but a kind of a version of them did in 1832, the year he died, when his clerk, Edwin Chadwick, wrote the 1832 Poor Law Act and workhouses were built um, across the country. So his idea is very influential. But his ideas, because they're so extreme, they're, they give you a really good sense of the kind of an insight into the history of kind of welfare reform and how those ideas repeat historically um, into the present. So, so one of the things <coughs> I'm, I'm basically doing is saying that we need to think about how neoliberalism, what we call neoliberalism, is kind of realised in the present through its policies, economic, social and political, are realised through the activation of stigma. So stigma is a form of power that's very much tied to particular types of capitalism, including neoliberal capitalism. So I'm kind of asking the how, what and whom of stigma, what kinds of subjects and objects stigma produces, and how these often have very deep historical roots. So what often seems like something new is very often the reactivation of um, historical stigmas that are already kind of tried and tested um, strategies of domination, dispossession, expropriation, exploitation, and violence. So when we're thinking about contemporary systems of the government of welfare, of poverty management, we can look at, for example, how the workhouse, and uh, Virginia Eubanks does exactly this, if only briefly in this book, the workhouses of the past are kind of also remade in what she calls the digital um, poor houses of the present. So how new technologies create new forms of capture. Um, the digital poor houses, so the fact, one of the things that austerity did and the Welfare Thought Reform Act did is push all welfare claimants online. Yeah, it pushed them onto digital online systems and that immediately put a lot of people outside that system. They find it very hard to navigate, to access. It deterred them, but it's also a way of tracking and controlling people, etc. So these, these digital poor houses are a good analogy for how we get a repetition in a very different form of something that's kind of trying to do a very similar thing. Okay. So I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. So we're going to take some questions and points of discussion now for about 30 minutes, if that's fine with Imogen. Yeah. Um, so if you could just put your hands up and I'm going to pass you a mic so it's all accessible and inclusive. <laughs>
time and it's really um, good to, to see your, your work and, and what you're working on. Because what I love about your work is that I always agree with it profoundly. Um, so my question is about, going back to what you were saying about the crafting of consent. This is something that I, I've been interested in for a long time really because I agree with you that these consent, the way people have built consent on particularly bad things that have happened over and over again has been happening for a very long time and the same techniques are used. And as you were describing the examples you gave, I was thinking specifically about, um, for instance, examples around uh, eugenics in this country in, in the 20s and 30s and um, how um, the same kind of process occurred and in terms of the elites um, crafting particular forms of thinking about eugenics and justifying to everyone else why disabled people should be killed and should be eliminated and should not be allowed to be born and that being followed by particular policies that would enact such, such a thing. And mm -hmm. And then everyone believing that. So people are always shocked when when they find out that Winston Churchill was a great uh, proponent of eugenics, for instance. Um, so these these things do have happened for a long time. But my question specifically is: so you, you haven't talked a lot about social media in particular. Mm. So I was really interested to know if in your project was drawing uh, at all from social media because. It seems to me that in this, you know, post-truth society that we live in at the moment, um, you know, people can say anything, and these things are not challenged. They just circulate in social media. So, so even though some of the techniques are the same, there are sort of new networks or structures that allow these ideas to circulate further without being questioned. Really. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I think that I would be tempted to say a bit like I was saying in the talk that social media is a new platform for the dissemination of particular ideas or stigmatizing ideologies or politics and what that it accelerates so it speeds up or accelerates a kind of process that is would be happening anyway or has happened anyway in different so I'm kind of saying the medium isn't the message I suppose <laughs> in a way I'm saying that I think I'd be tempted to say that the new technologies are really important for understanding, for example, authoritarian populism now, for understanding someone like Trump. But what's also very important for someone is Trump's a real example. Yeah, so he uses Twitter, he uses it to lie, to, to uh, he uses it politically as a strategy. So he's bypassing all the normal constraints or processes we expect someone who's president of the United States to do to kind of create and ferment a kind of online, you know, and then we all retweet him because we're outraged and that just gives him more publicity, et cetera. So you can see a kind of machine politics at work in social media. But what else does Trump do? Well, he uses rallies, okay? So the, one of his, of his main things he does is he uses rallies to mass his base. So he uses the rally and that's a very classic form of fascist politics, okay? That's what uh, fascists did in Europe, Mussolini did, Hitler did, is use the rally to mash your base. So he's still using kind of classic political techniques alongside new media. The fascists in Germany in the 1930s, the Nazis used the radio. Radio was new. They used radio and they used film to produce the stigma 
politics, to produce a fascist stigma politics, to produce their racial eugenic, to promote their racial eugenic science. So I think I'd be, again, like I'd be, te I, I want to withdraw from the idea of the newness a little bit and say it's different and it's intensification, but it gives us a false sense, I think, of participating. I think the real danger is that we feel that kind of we have a voice because we're, we're, we're participating in the redistribution of ideas online. And I think that's, that's probably its danger that it feels, or the argument that democratising is a danger. I don't think it is. I think it's just a, a platform that accelerates existing and very often historically entrenched ideas. And at the moment, it's being used most effectively by authoritarian populist regimes, as we've seen, you know, Russian box fa factories, as we see um, the kind of uh, massive harvesting of data by massive companies like Facebook uh, for their own reward. Um, so it's really important, but I'm also I want to withdraw a bit from the idea that it's completely new. Um, it's another kind of panopticon. It's another kind of form of capitalism, but it's also really familiar. What's in it, the content, is completely familiar. Does that? Thank you very much for your talk. I really appreciate the genealogical approach you've taken and the biopolitical approach as well that you've taken to the stigma. And my question is um, on the relationship between stigma and shame mm -hmm. that you established. So just to follow on from your approach, that's very much about problematizing stigma mm -hmm. and how it's been approached in sociology in terms of mm -hmm. social interaction. Um, for me, it seems that you're making a an argument about the relationship between shame and stigma as being necessarily linked. No, I no. that's good. That, I'm not saying that. <laughs> good, great. So, okay. So for me, st for me, stigma is so if we think about stigma that's being it's being produced by a political speech or a TV pro or a person in an interaction is the marking of somebody. That's what I'm really interested. I'm interesting in is the mark. Now it might produce shame, but it might not. It might, it might not work. You know, I might be, sh you might not be able to shame me f in your attempt to do so through stigmatizing me. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I am, I think state shame for me is the emotional effect that may or may not come as a consequence of being stigmatized. So, yeah, that yeah. Because so, in that sense, when we're thinking about shame, we're thinking about in terms of self-regulation as well, a kind of individuating practice, whereas stigma, how you're using it, is more of a dividing practice, legitimating the exclusion of others, or branding, as you term it, branding. Yeah, I mean, I think shame, I think most of the right on shame would say that it's a sort of yeah. public emotion. Yeah. So you only, you don't feel ashamed really when you're by yourself. You don't sit and suddenly feel ashamed. You feel a shame works as a, as a public emotion because it's in front of other people. You're made to feel ashamed in front of others. So in a way, it's shares some. It's like the emotion that goes most closely, I think, with stigma. But stigma doesn't always produce shame. The confusion is, is because the legal people call those shaming practices, and I call them that. But to me, actually, they're stigmatizing practices. That's what I would properly call them. They may or may not produce shame. They may be intended to produce uh, shame, but they may or may not produce shame. I think just to, what I would say that's really apparent to me through the more sociological part of my project where I'm interviewing, talking to people, the more empirical, if you like, part, is what becomes clear is when people are stigmatised for a long time. So if you've lived through austerity, as somebody uh, who I've interviewed who's on disability benefits, and you've gone through that process of the continual stigmatization, where it's your interactions, it's the testing process, it's Atos, and now it's Maximus testing you, you're constantly 
made to feel like a failure. Um, then it's the radio, it's the newspapers, all around you is this like production of stigma. Over time, even if you began with quite uh, an intact sense of being able to defend yourself, over time that corrodes your defences and the kind of you end up being tattooed by that to the point that you end up becoming almost the object. Very often people I've talked to about it talk about dehumanisation but almost how they feel they become the object that's being produced in those discourses. But it's not always shame, it might be despair, humiliation might be a term they use or other terms, more mental health terms, depression, anxiety, feeling suicidal because you feel so objectified by that. But, so, but shame is very often, there's a slippage between them, but I see them as distinct. slides which I think you probably slip through uh, yeah. to get through. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in the impact of, or your views on the impact of austerity on tangible outcomes in terms of, uh, I saw on the slides, um, 120,000 excess deaths. Yeah. Uh, so really it's around um, <sighs> those people die of something. Yeah. Uh, process of death certification doesn't say shame, it yeah. doesn't say despair, yeah. um, and you know, I mean you look at um, suicide statistics, yeah. actually broadly stable. So yeah. Not, su realize. not suicide attempts though. Not suicide attempts, but suicide yeah. deaths by suicide. Yeah. But there's an, ar the there's an argument about that data. Indeed there is. Yeah. So, so, um, <laughs> But those excess deaths are amongst, uh, a good portion of them are amongst women in the 60s and 70s. Mm. Mm. Um, I was just wondering uh, the long-term impact yeah. plus um, despair, unhappily, unhappily yeah. it's misery. Um, and the financial crisis is a decade ago. What if there's another another crisis, an economic crisis yeah. in there? So, so what impact? Could we intensify this? Because this is where I think there's a difference between the Wall Street crash of 29 yeah. and the financial crisis. Yeah. In that, that was actually the crucible for the formation of welfare states in various parts of the world. Yeah. Um, whereas we're not going to go down that route again, unless perhaps, okay, we will address that by detaching income from work through UBI or something like that. Yeah. Awesome. So really just to, what do you think of the long-term impacts of austerity shame on people's health and well-being? And hmm, say if there's another crisis, how can we make this worse? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Danny Dawling uh, and, um, on the name, um, the dem demographers, um, neoliberalism makes you sick. Bambra, yeah. I mean, I think they're good on tracking that kind of relationship in different ways between austerity and mortality and kind of health inequalities and the impact to them. Um, but what, which bit do you want me to answer? Do you want me to think what's going to happen next? <laughs> well, this is why, of course, what's happening right now in Parliament is critical, because what we had was a crisis. If What we have is a crisis that was, in a way, a political choice, austerity. Well, it was a political choice, a political choice to... Um, dismantle um, what remained and privatise what remained of welfare state. And 
we're, we're, we're really just still in the middle of that. So if you look at local authority cuts that are going through now, I don't know how it is in Liverpool, but in Lancashire, County Council, they've just, they're facing bankruptcy and they've basically have gone through every single thing they do, every bit of land and building their own and they're getting rid of everything and going to just a statutory, the things they absolutely have to do legally and it's going to have just devastating impact and that's only just starting. So, you know, we're really still in the, really in the middle of, of austerity cuts right now and there's no sense that they're going to stop anytime soon. So if we have an economic crash now, we're going to have a real austerity effectively, a real economic crisis rather than a crisis that was a kind of political choice. And the question would be what the government, whoever the government is, chooses to do in terms of trying to s soften the impact of that. And I don't know. It depends who the government is, and how. What what is welfare for? You know, the welfare state. Welfare really is the state. Yeah. The when we get a welfare state, the formation of kind of the nation state. And what if we look about it more historically? And what it does is, is a kind of way of protecting people from capital, from capitalists and capitalism. It's, it, it's there, it's what the state does, is sort of it use welfare, where there, capital's there, trying to extract labour and to get as much out of it as it can, and the welfare state's there as a kind of umbrella to mediate that relationship between people and capital. So if that's eroded down to its bare bones, we're more exposed, you know, the things that were built up through struggles, like unions, protections at work, all those sorts of things, healthcare are eroded, 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 it's less protection. Um, so if you're rich, you're okay, because you can buy those services, but if you're exposed in any way, or become ill or exposed, then you're much more vulnerable. And that's why we get growing inequalities. So really, it, it's, I, I think, I think the most optimistic reading, and I think it's, you know, I do think this sort of work, it sounds depressing, but actually it's quite optimistic to do this work because you learn so much from the history that enables you to see the present more clearly and see, to think about which way, how we can shape how it might go. And I think optimistically what we're seeing is, is the kind of last gasps of the particular version of capitalism that we've been having since the 70s, really, neoliberal capitalism. And I think that's, you know, we're getting an authoritarian version of that that's trying to hold on. But I, I, I can't see that lasting. And I think something else will replace it. The question is what? And the question then is look, learning from how populism that we're living through at the moment how, how, the, how they use different forms of media to garner consent. How can a more equal a project consent with more equal distribution of wealth, our common wealth, how can we garner consent with that? How can we use the same technologies and media to create um, a more positive distributive project? And I think that's really the challenge. But because the media companies are all owned by such a few number of people because their interests are the same as a lot of the political elites. It's, very, it's a very difficult challenge. I mean, that's where social media sometimes p potentially could have a role, but, you know. But I think maybe, you know, the optimism is that young people be becoming Brexit, I think, and austerity and the conditions in universities, fees and debt has made young people more, much more politicised and much more aware about what's happening. I, I don't know what will happen. Do you? Do you? <laughs> that's, that's what it boils down to. I'm an optimist. Yeah. I, I agree yeah. with you that neoliberalism is exhausted yeah. and there's a paradigm change on the yeah. cards if we're bold enough. Yeah. What that will precisely look like. I don't know. Yeah. But I think there are grounds for optimism, although there may be I think so. more misery slightly ahead.
I, I, I would agree with that forecast. <laughs> Uh, can I just ask you a question that sort of relates to that thing? I mean, I, I found it all very, very interesting, Imogen, particularly the, the continuity of the 300 years of how you know, stigma has been mobilised mm. as, 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 as a form of power. Um, it is a slightly depressing subject because you know, our, flows, our sort of follows the ebbs and flows of the of fortunes of yeah. the of capitalism as well. But I noticed at the beginning you had a couple of quotes, or one from Evan um, Goffman, but also another one from Michelle de Soteau. And it just got me thinking of like issues of um, the carnivalesque and, 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 and resistance and, and mm. you know, form, you know, various, whether it's by individuals or groups in their mm. attempt to resist the, the application of yeah. um, And I think when you talk about policy porn, for example, yeah. in one of the series that was popular around the time, something like Shameless, yeah. which sort of explored how people who have been stigmatized sort to you know, yeah. really appropriate that label or to survive the, the stigma and so on. And I just wonder what you know what what aspects of, of, of resistance that you do do you look at that in the yeah. as well or, or what your thoughts are on the notion yeah. of resistance? Well as soon as we start thinking about stigma as a form of power, we we can start thinking about it as a of resistance. So I kind of think of stigma as a site always of struggle. So someone may tattoo you on your head you're a runaway or a thief or may symbolically <laughs> badge you but people resist that continuously the whole history of stigma is also a history of how people resist that in more or less political ways so very much stigma for me is a site of inscription which is also a site of struggle and resistance I think that thing of being worn down by it is true, but I think when it becomes more collectivised, and this is where things like the campaign I talked about become important, like the Poverty Alliance campaign, when it becomes more collectivised, actually, people can start to see the, where the stigma's coming from or think about that. So what's for, when you talk to people who, you know, the, the group I'm working with in, in Morecambe and Lancaster, in the Poverty Commission, you know, they can theorise that the stigma is being produced from outside and who and how it's being produced. They're, they're theorists of stigma. But actually, as they talk about it with each other, they're being able to do that kind of politicises and enables them to see, to defend themselves better against it. Uh, in the chapter on Goffman, in the book, you know, uh, from stigma power to black power, what I do is resituate him in the context of civil rights and the black power movement, which is kind of an anti-stigma politics. And I kind of read him alongside them to challenge his kind of a political account through the politics of anti-stigma coming out of civil rights. So yeah, so resistance is always there. And the last, the conclusion of the book's gonna be about raging against the stigma machine. We're quite interested in the history of machine breaking. <laughs> you know, how people resisted through breaking. So maybe that's what we need to do. Chuck our iPhones in the bin, you know. It's breaking the technologies, actually stopping them from operating smoothly, uh, I think is key. So resistance is massive. It's just fitting, you know, it's, this book is like enormous. I think it's about 10 books. And um, yeah, I need to stress resistance more, I think. Yeah, it'd be, le it'd be less depressing if I had more of that. Just thank you very much, Imogen. It was really, really interesting. But I'm just picking up what you just said there. And you talked about the group you're working with mm. and resistance. And were you talking about collective? action or collective consciousness yeah and one of the points is stigma is very isolated yes and so how do we you know in terms of social action yeah how might we take that forward yeah i mean i suppose precisely by trying to understand stigma as a form of power that is crafted and produced for particular reasons, you know, more or less directly or indirectly, that I see that as a way of, you know, tr trying 
to shift stigma back to its sites of production to say actually you know you may feel ashamed but actually your shame's being produced by these mechanisms so that's and I but I think one of the main ways in terms of working with people in poverty is talking about it and talking about it with so the, the poverty commission I'm on has got, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with like how poverty commissions are working, there's about 18 running around the country, I think you've got one in Liverpool, but there's fire service, police, loads of GPs, public health, the, the food bank manager, um, who else, DWP are on it. Um, you know, every every everyone gets teachers, teaching assistants. You know me, and then lots of people who are uh, living in poverty of different kinds. Dis people with disabilities, uh, kids are on it. Um, people who've lost their jobs, people with mental health. So all different types of people. And one is is, is that actually that they're not just talking to each other about Vincent Tess, but they're talking to representatives from the organisations that they've encountered stigma with and that but we're all talking together in a kind of safe place and that is quite profound actually I mean what it can do I think is limited but for example we're going to go in and talk to the job centre staff in Lancaster and we're going to talk, they're going to testify about what it was like for them, the experiences they've had in that job centre. But they're going to talk with authority as experts, they're the experts. So stuff like that, I think, can do small things. I just think you need this bigger structure, you know, it's not coming from nowhere. The stigma being enacted by welfare staff and the front line is coming from a political agenda in this case that's quite deliberate and very crafted it's not always so deliberate but it is in this instance so you need both a kind of structural account and you need but I think collective you know it's calling it out it's not enough by itself but it's something it's, it's, it's being able to speak back to it is really important so. does that yeah, yeah. I mean, it's Yeah. Given how I see it. I think it's, I mean, it really, it's about consciousness, isn't it? It's about class consciousness or consciousness of other types of discrimination. It's about seeing, being conscious of something means developing a political consciousness of something that's not just about you, that de individualizes it, but it's about a collective. We've got time for one last quick question or comment. It's a good question. You're making me think now. Oh yeah, as soon as I thank you talk, um, I've got one question for you. Um, so, so stigma. Yeah. Maybe, what do you think? Okay, so okay, I'm gonna just ask you a really foundational question. Yeah. What what's like your what's your like greatest what do you think society's aim should be? To do to deal with stigma. No, like just in general, like what, okay. do, you, what do you think society's biggest aim should be to do? Uh I think societies should be there to distribute wealth, health and opportunity fairly. But why? Why? Yeah. Uh, because I think that is politically just or unethically and morally just. Because the people who do the work um, who are members of our society and the people we should be distributing the wealth so what we're seeing is a massive increase in the wealth at the top 
and I think that is unethical morally and politically. Nobody needs ten billion pounds. So I think wealth should be more evenly distributed. So basically that's what I think a society is there to do. Or societies. Distribute wealth and resource. It's our society. It is ours, is that, you know, that's the point. It is ours, it's not someone else's. It's our place, work, it's our city, or it's our town. But actually what's happening is that the enclosures of those spaces, in order to extract money upwards, or wealth and resources upwards, and, I, and it's robbery, basically, that's going on. So that's the aim of, of, of um, let's say, of the stigma is to eventually do that. So the aim of stigma, I suppose, in, the, in relation to what we're talking about now, is to make people consent to that. It's to say, it's to create divisions between people so that you say, so for example, research shows that like re people who are really quite poor, yeah, have got no money, um, you know, I'm thinking of um, somebody's research here. Um, who, who does interviews with people in poverty, uh, and they'll still say her next door is cheating the benefits. She's a scrounger across the street, yeah? And that's the impact of this stigma production, is that we all start to use it in our interactions and say, you're a scrounger, you're cheating me, that migrant has taken my job from me, that person's jumping the queue. And it creates division. So it's a political tool so it keeps the poor people poorer. to create division. So it undoes the forms of empathy or solidarity or compassion that we might have. It really erodes that. So you get an intensification stigma production from above. It kind of really erodes our ability to, um, to think more about what we have in common, I guess, with other people. Yeah? Anyone really itching for the last comment, or can we give them a break? It's, it's sort of a nice point on which to finish, isn't it? It's a good question. Final remark. Uh, right, I mean, thank you so much. I think I speak on behalf of all of us here for this wonderful and inspiring talk. Um, I think it's just it's really encouraging to see someone who can be a public sociologist and a critical sociologist. Design, uh, time, especially now. That's the point of being a sociologist. Absolutely, it is, but uh, just wish I would have around. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Uh, so, again, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.